Showcase Sundays today on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. It's the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse 11th Annual Season! The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is the seasonal series of radio drama recreations in which producers and actors from the modern age of audio drama recreate and reproduce classic old-time radio plays. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is open to all producers and creators of modern audio drama to bring to a contemporary audience these classic plays. And now, over to the host of the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse this season, waiting in his seat in the balcony, Mr. David Alt. Thank you to Jack Ward for bringing in this, our eighth adventure at the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. I'm David Alt, and this week we go local with two episodes from the incredible Halifax's own Lion's Den Theatre with director Keith Morrison. Lion's Den has long been a staple of grand entertainment in Nova Scotia, and this time Mr. Morrison recreates his smash stage show Plan 9 from Outer Space. And while technically not an old-time radio show, this was originally an old-time B-movie, and his adaptation of the script will have you laughing in the aisles. Continuing the hilarity, Lion's Den also recreates a classic OTR episode of Archie, that lovable teen who has graced radio, comics, and television for decades. And and, uh, that's the curtain raising on tonight's double feature from Lion's Den Theatre. Coming from Lion's Den Audio Theatre. Curse on the Baskerville family. The legend. Black Hound. Craving the blood of the Baskervilles. No end of anxiety. Curse on the Baskerville family. A violent and unexpected death. The moor at night. Dreaded beast. Curse on the Baskerville family. Mr. Holmes? The game's afoot. Coming Summer 2020, from Lion's Den Audio Theatre. And a bottle of rum. Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. An original audio adaptation. The following is a dark comedy of a satirical nature that some listeners might hate or even be offended by. Listener discretion is advised. There are no F-words, and this audio production features no nudity that you'll know of.
Lion's Den Theater is pleased to present Plan 9 from Outer Space, the audio play. Brought to you by the magic of cell phones, tablets, and laptops. This production was recorded during a period of social isolation, restriction, and distancing, and compiled for your enjoyment by Lion's Den Theater. This production features Heather Beresford, Eric Bond, Dan Bray, Matt Campbell, Wesley J. Colford, Rebecca Curie, Allie House, Michael G. McDonald, Ashley McLeod, Kevin McNeil, Wayne McKay, Robin McKittrick, Chili Morrison, Daniel Morrison, Kevin Morrison, Terrence Murphy, Mark Penny, Dan Roy, James F.W. Thompson, Jen Tubbert, and Matt Tufts. In an attempt to simulate a live theater experience during this YouTube premiere, we ask that you use the chat feature minimally. But feel free to mash those emojis whenever the spirit moves you. Comments are more than welcome after the show has ended. And now, from Edmonton to Toronto, to Moncton, to Halifax, to Cape Breton Island, we are pleased to bring you... Plan 9 from Outer Space. Greetings, my friends. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. Remember, my friends, future events such as these will affect you in the future. You, my friends, are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. Now, my friends, for the first time we are bringing you the full story of what happened on that fateful day in the future. My friends, let us punish the guilty, let us reward the innocent, let us treat the uninvolved with a lukewarm indifference. My friends, can your heart stand the shocking facts, the shocking facts, about grave robbers from outer space? All of us on this earth know that there is a time for us to live and a time for us to die. Yet death is always a shock to those of us left behind, like it is for this old man standing to my right. It's always more of a shock when death comes without warning, like it did to the wife of the aforementioned old man to my right. We're gathered here above a newly opened grave at sundown, sundown of the day, but also sundown of this old man's life. We spoke earlier today about this very matter. He asked me, what should I do? I cannot go on. As an unmarried person several years younger, far healthier and much less jaded by the passing years, I was not qualified to give an answer. But I wished him the best. And with that, the funeral is over. It was when the grave was dug that strange things began to happen. Say, did you hear something? I thought I did. I don't like noises, especially when there ain't supposed to be any. Yeah, it's all sort of spooky-like. Maybe we're just getting old. Whatever it was, it's gone now. And that's the best thing for us, too. Gone. Yeah, let's go. What about the grave? We can get it tomorrow morning. I'll borrow my mother's backhoe. Ain't no spooky noises in the morning. You can say that again. What is that? It's... it's a walking corpse. That ain't possible. Possible or not, it's possible. And it's coming right for us. No! 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 Meanwhile, at 
the same time, but in a different place. We're right on schedule. I can see the San Fernando Valley out there now if I look out one of the windows. You better radio in for landing instructions, Denny. Burbank Tower, this is Flight 1-2. Over. Wouldn't surprise me if he was asleep this time of the afternoon. This is Burbank Tower. If I was asleep, you idiots would never get back on the ground. You got me there, Mac. You got me there. This is Flight 1-2-er, requesting a... Holy mackerel! Jeff, is this a time to talk about saintly fish? What is it, Jeff? Looks like a... a flying saucer. Burbank Tower, 1-2, are you in trouble? Over. Did I hear trouble? See for yourself. What in the world? Ain't nothing from this world, sister. Shoot it down, Jeff. This is a commercial airline. How can we shoot it down? We've got ballistic missiles. You know, just in case. Heavens! Heavens nothing. Do you think the passengers saw it? Don't think so. It's mid-afternoon, so most of them are asleep. But I'll go check. Just keep it quiet until we get further instructions. Right. Go ahead, Burbank Tower. After the funeral, the old man returned to his modest home and his limited possessions. The grief of his wife's death became a greater and greater agony. The warm home they had so long shared became a cold tomb. The sweet memory of her joyous life was soured by her sudden death. His salty tears became saltier as his bitterness grew. The once beautiful blue sky, blanketed by bright fluffy clouds, became a monochromatic gray shroud that loomed above her rotting corpse. Her beautiful rose garden, planted by her very own hands, reminded him of the lost roses of her cheeks. The fullness of the rich blossoms reminded him of the supple innocence of her breasts. The firmness of the ground, the proud and stoic earth that lay so loyally beneath his feet, also reminded him of the firmness of her boobs. He was old and alone. Heartbroken by his loss, the old man left his home, never to return again. At the funeral of the old man, unknown to his mourners, his dead wife was watching. And with that, the funeral is over. First, his wife dies of a fairly commonplace disease. Then he's hit by a car. Go figure. Ain't life a mystery. We should return to our respective homes. Yes. It was a beautiful service. Oh, yes. What is that? It can't be. It looks like two dead bodies. <coughs> ah! I guess that solves the mystery of the missing grave diggers. Oh, God. <laughs> That's the fifth siren in the last hour. Yeah? Are you still in the sky, Jeff? Still up there, flying? Huh? I've never seen you in this mood before. Never. Is it something about your flight earlier today? You got it, Chicky Boo. What happened, Jeff? What happened during your flight earlier today? In the sky? I saw a, a flying saucer. A saucer? Like the kind from up there? Yeah, that kind. It lit up the whole area. Well, did you report it? Yeah, we met with some general. Then you know what he did? Hmm? Do you? He laughed at us. Like we were a couple of Parisian street mimes. Or a pair of song and dance men at a Borscht Belt supper club. Laughed right in our faces. He told us not to tell a soul about it. He said he'd kill us if we told anyone. Threatened to kill our families, too. 
If I say a word to anyone, I could be in grave danger. So could you. You, me, our parents, Uncle Wendell, all of us. Oh, it burns me up. Those bastards from Top Army Brass covering something like this up. What are they trying to hide? Oh, Jeff, relax. Just try to forget it. I'm trying, Paula. But it happened just this afternoon, and it's impossible to forget something that's so... so... so recent. I know. It's just all so damn... recent. Jeff, you've been working so hard. I think you could use a vacation. I was talking to the Wilsons today. They invited us up to the farm for the weekend. Just think of the farm, Jeff. You love the farm. The orange groves, the orchard, grapes growing on the vine, cherries as big as your fist, juicy peaches sweet and ripe, pepperoni bushes as far as the eye can see. Maybe you're right, Paula. Maybe I'm just going all... Looney Tunes. Was that a... A flying saucer? <laughs> you bet your ass it was. Are you okay? I think so. And the baby? It is fine. What are you going to do, Jeff? Nothing, Paula. Nothing at all. Oh, Jeff. Tell me more about the farm. The police, led by Inspector Daniel Clay, arrived at the graveyard. Evening, Inspector. Detective. Inspector. Officer. Good evening, Lieutenant. Sergeant. Good evening, Detective. Constable. So, who found them, Patrolman? Two mourners from a funeral. It's in my report. Richards? Howdy, Inspector. Here you are, Deputy. Thank you, Texas Ranger. Has the examiner been around yet? He just left. The hearse will be here in a minute. Keep an eye on the scene, Detective. I'm going to do my best to look around. It's pretty dark, Inspector. Don't worry. I have a flashlight in the trunk of my car. I knew it would be dark, so I made sure to bring it. So I'll go get it from my car. It's parked right over there. Once I have it, I'll be able to shine light on things I want to look at. That would otherwise be too dark. I can do that when I have it in my hand. My flashlight, that is. It's in my parked car. Over there. Be careful. I'm a big boy, detective. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a bobcat tore into him. Yeah, the guy on the left is named Scrivens. He used to run a hardware store until he got cleaned out during the recession. His wife, Neela, sings alto in the choir at St. Augustine's. His daughter runs an art gallery in one of the big cities. I played baseball with his son when I was a kid. He was a heck of a second baseman. Best left-handed batter I ever saw. Poor old Scrivens. Such a nice fella. Always had a smile on his face. And the other guy? That's his co-worker. Grave digger number two. Damn shame. Sure is. Say, detective, you picking up on that funny odor? I couldn't miss it. Is everyone all right? I'm fine. I'm all right. I kind of bent my finger back when I fell, but I'm okay. All right. There's the guys from the morgue. Inspector Clay has the flashlight, so they'll never find us out here in the dark. We'd best meet them at the gates. God bless you, old Scrivens. No... Not seeing anything here. No, wait. I am seeing something here. Is that you, old man? Is that you, old man's wife? I thought you were both dead. Back up. Back away. Back up. I have a gun. I have my flashlight. What was that, Detective? It sounded like Inspector Clay. Look. Oh, no. 
It's Clay. He's dead. What's going on here? One thing is for sure. Inspector Clay is dead and somebody, or something, most likely somebody, is responsible. You're in charge now, detective. Get on the radio and tell the coroner he's got to make another trip out here. Of course, detective. Some days just are not worth the price of admission. Your Highness, General Eros and I have returned from Earth. What progress? We contacted government officials. We know they received the message, but have not yet replied. Curious, do you have any further plans? Yes, we have a new plan. Our last eight have failed, but this time for sure. I see. This is our ninth plan. We call it Plan Nine. Naturally. It has been impossible to work with these Earth creatures. Their souls are too controlled. Their minds are too independent. And... Until very recently, we have been unable to fully communicate due to our language barriers. What has changed? They have finally developed the Dictorobotter. And they can understand our messages? Yes, but they are not responding. And you told them we're here to help them with their development. Not exactly, Your Loftiness. Plans 1 through 8 were peaceful communications and a series of good deeds to build peace between our people. We have built monuments... Pyramids and hinges of stone, we've cured diseases, advanced their technology. And they've not been grateful. No, they've taken the credit themselves. Called them triumphs of the human race. That is unfortunate. It is indeed your up Communication is very important right now. They are very close to developing Solaranite. Really? Are they the only race on the planet? No, there are others. Many others. Such as? I don't know. Dogs, horses, penguins, cows. Birds and monkeys. Hamsters. Coyotes. Camels. Coyotes. I already said coyotes. Chickens. Zebras. Finches. Lots of bugs. Crocodiles. Frogs. Lemurs. Tigers. Have you contacted any of these species for assistance? Fish. Yes. Most have been sympathetic, but are also somewhat powerless. In many ways, the humans treat the other Earth species with the same overall dickishness they do us. Dickishness, you say? I do say dickishness. Have you considered bringing any of these species together for a summit where they can work with us in the destruction of humanity? We did your wicked awesomeness. We arranged a short meeting with a flamingo and crocodile. We hoped to build a common ground between the two to see if they could work together and put a stop to human domination. And how did that go? Very well for the crocodile. The poor bird. We had no choice but to up the ante. We have put Plan 9 into action. Plan 9. Hmm. The resurrection of the dead. Long distance electric shock into the pituitary and the pineal glands of the recently dead. These walking corpses will take over the world and be under our control. Have you attempted any of this plan yet? Yes, Excellency. How successful has it been? We have risen two so far, an old man and an old man's wife. We intend to raise the body of a policeman as well. And the living, they have no suspicion of your moves? Some suspicion, but nothing concrete. It's too bad it all has to be handled this way, but it must. Yes, Excellency. Continue on. Report to me in two Earth days. Saucers were seen in every major city in the country. The army was quickly mobilized. Rockets were sent up. Colonel Tom Edwards, in charge of saucer field activities, was about to make the biggest decision of his long career. He made that decision. He gave the universal signal to fire. Fire! Colonel? Hello, Jackson. That was quite the sight, Colonel. 
The sight I wish I'd never seen. Are you worried, sir? They gotta have some reason for their visits. Visits? We didn't always shoot at them, Jackson. Oh? Nope. For years we've been hoping they made contact. Oh, I never knew about that. It was covered up by those bastards at Top Army Brass. The government will never admit that those ships are aliens because aliens don't exist. Officially. Right now it's all a bunch of questions, Jackson. Who are they? What do they want? Where are they going and where do they come from? What do they look like? What do they eat? How do they eat? Do they use western utensils or sticks like our Asian friends? Napkins? Tucked like bibs or spread across one's lap? Do they have napkins at all or simply wipe their mouths on their sleeves like a pack of wild lumberjacks and lumberjills? Too many questions, Jackson. And too many damn non-answers. Understood, sir. As you were, Private. Yes, sir. Colonel? Yes, Jackson. Thank you for taking a few minutes out of your day to chat with me. No problem, Jackson. It's all one big intergalactic game of checkers. I still think you should go into town and stay with your mother until I get back. Don't most men try to keep their wives from going home to Mama? I got a good mind to call in sick. Maybe get Denny to uh, fly this one solo. Denny? Fly alone? Doesn't it take two? It ain't the tango, Paula. I'll call in sick. You'll do no such thing. You are only going to Australia with a short layover in Sweden. You'll be back before you know it. That's not the point. Go toddle off and fly your flying machine, fly boy. Be careful. Don't worry about me. You're the only thing I do worry about, baby cakes. Mm, the saucers are a bit of a worry, but there's something in that cemetery next door, and that's too close for comfort. The saucers are up there. The cemetery is over there. I'll be safely locked up in here. Promise me you'll lock the door? I promise. And you'll get a home security system installed tomorrow? Yes. And you'll put a fake security system sticker in the window for tonight? Already did. Don't worry, Jeff. I'll be asleep in half an hour, with your pillow beside me. My pillow? I need something to keep me company when you're away. <laughs> you crazy kid. I even talk to it. <laughs> you crazy kid. Sometimes I even sing to it. <laughs> you insane preteen. If you get lonely, promise me that you'll think of me and know that I'm thinking of you. I promise. I love you, darling. If there are any problems, go right over to the Harpers and call the police. I will. And your crossbow. Strap to my back. Lady, you sure are a piece of work. You be sure to come back to me as soon as you can. I will, Paula. I will always come back to you. Always remember that. I will always come back to you. Always come back to you. And I will always be here for you. Always. It is always hard to say words over the body of a friend, and Inspector Clay was a friend. The final bell has tolled on that friendship, his career, and his life, and we say goodbye to Inspector Clay as we lay him to a premature rest. If you believe in the words in this good book, and I'm 90% sure I do, his soul is passed to paradise where he will remain in eternal joy. And with that, the funeral is over. Circle of life, eh? The older you get, the more of these you go to, I guess. Do you believe in all this alien stuff we're hearing? What about the zombie rumors? And how do the Freemasons figure into this, if at all? Who knows? It's a great mystery. One of two great mysteries. Two? Number one, who is killing all these people? Why are they dying in such horrible ways? Is it aliens or zombies or just one big elaborate hoax to teach someone a lesson? What is going on in this town? That's the first question. What's the second? If the grave diggers are dead, then who dug Inspector Clay's grave? Penny for your thoughts, Jeff? Huh? Uh, what's a penny? Oh, uh, yeah. 
A penny. Mm. Uh, nah, Denny. I'm fine. Cat cut your tongue? Huh? You've been mighty silent this trip, Jeff. Yeah. I even told you that joke about the penguin. Not even a smile. Sorry, Denny. I've been preoccupied. Listen, Jeff. We get 33 passengers back there who could be preoccupied. You don't get the luxury of being preoccupied. Asshole. I guess you're right, Denny. Is it Paula? Your wife? Yeah. Nothing wrong with you two? Oh, no, no. I'm just worried about her being alone and all of those... things... flying overhead. Yeah, I don't know nothing about those crazy skybirds, but I'll bet you the police figured out that whole cemetery business by now. You're probably right, Denny. And therefore... I won't take that bet. You know, Jeff, if you're all bent out of shape about this, you can always use one of the spare parachutes we keep in back and jump out as we fly over your home. Thanks, Edie, but I'll be okay. If you are really that worried, Jeff, why don't you ask Mac to call her? Great idea. I want to put you in my mouth and suck on you till my tongue changes color because you, my friend, are a lifesaver. Say, Edie, when we land, how about a nice night out on the town? We land at 4 a.m. The town we're going to shuts down at 9 p.m. I got some friends that can keep things going a little later for us. Let's just make sure we land safely first. No need to worry about that. He's just worried about Paula, his wife. Yeah, I read about that cemetery business. I warned you not to buy a house next to that cemetery. Between the creepiness of it all, the kids drinking on weekends, and all those genealogists doing their research, I don't know how you ever get any peace of mind. It's all we could afford at the time. Would either of you like a chai latte? Please. Not now, but how about some late tonight when we land? We can grab a little dinner, perhaps some dancing. Maybe a line or two of coke? You sure know how to charm a lady, Denny boy. It's a date. Let me call Mac. We'll check on her for you. Thanks, Denny. Looks like we've got some thunder coming up. Residents near the cemetery had no idea that the thunderclap halfway across the world spelled ominous doom for their quaint little town. From that blast of thunder arose the figure of the dead old man. With evil in his dead heart, vicious thoughts in his dead mind, and an insatiable hunger for blood in his dead stomach, he was surely up to no good. Jeff Trent's wife, Paula, peacefully slept on her back porch, unaware that danger was about to pay a visit. Hello? Oh, no, you didn't wake me. I was sitting here reading. Who is this? Oh, hi, Mac. Mac, I can't keep up this charade any longer. I was sleeping. No, it's okay. I'll get plenty after the baby is born. Is everything okay with Jeff? Oh, that's good. Oh, how sweet of him. That is the nicest thing he's ever done. So thoughtful. Thank you, Mac. Good night. Good night. How very sweet. That was brilliant, Detective. What was, Kelton? Making that rooster noise so those monsters would think it was morning. We never would have gotten here in time to save Mrs. Trent. When you've been on the force as long as I have, you pick up a few tricks. What are these things, Detective? No idea, Kelton. How is Mrs. Trent? She's passed out, but she'll be fine. 
We should get one of the boys to come take her home, make her a cup of tea and draw her a nice warm bath. Maybe light some candles for her. Put some flower petals in the tub. Maybe get some Epsom salts and a lavender-scented facial scrub with just a hint of Setsuma or vanilla. I think the pharmacy is having a sale on pumice stones and there's a spare loof at the station. Good idea, Detective. Look, that grave's been disturbed. Holy cow. It's been broken into. No, you stupid son of a bitch. That grave has been busted out of. It has. Good find, Kelton. I'm going to make sure you're out of that uniform sooner than you thought. Oh, detective, I insist you buy me dinner first. Promoted, Kilton. Oh, okay. This spot looks mighty familiar, as if I've been here before. Should we see whose grave it is? How, Kilton? I don't know. Normally, we could wait until the morning and ask the grave diggers. Unfortunately, we can talk to them until we're blue in the face and they won't say a damned word because they, too, are dead. So we should talk to the clergyman of the church. He might remember who was buried here. If he doesn't, there should be a burial registry we can access. Unless it's a Roman Catholic cemetery. If it is a Catholic graveyard, we have to wait 75 years from the date of burial for the register to be available for public viewing. Unless... Unless we get permission from the bishop of the diocese. If the bishop says no, we are out of luck. This is all moot, of course, if this is a non-Catholic cemetery. What else can we do if it's a Catholic cemetery? We'll have to appeal to the Holy Father. The Pope? Yes. I'm sure he would overrule the 75-year rule in a case like this. Well, let's do it. It's tricky, but could be done. Maybe I'll get one of the boys to write a letter to the prefecture of the papal household requesting a visit with the pontiff. Let me see. Typically takes nine weeks to get a response. Nine weeks. That will put us right at the change of season. In summer, the papal visits are done in the outdoor square, which holds around 80,000. In the winter, we'd have to go in the papal audience hall. That only holds around 5,500. The winter would be better. There are smaller lines, but there are far fewer tickets available. Of course, we could just jump on a plane tomorrow and hope the Swiss guards will just let us pass the gate. I'll go home and pack. Of course, guards will only let us in if there are spare tickets. Well, there are only two of us. Three. Three? My sister-in-law would have to come. Why? She's always wanted an excuse to go back to Italy. She's from Florence. It would be helpful to have a local. That settles it. We're going to Rome to ask the Pope to overturn this whole 75-year thing. No, wait, Kelton, we can't. Are you familiar with Riccardo Baroni? The Italian tenor? Yeah, that's the one. Baroni is playing Alfredo in a remounted production of Verdi's La Triata in Rome. It's his farewell tour. I'd never forgive myself if I was so close and missed Baroni's Alfredo. It's an open-air production and they're only doing matinees. Timing conflicts with when the Pope accepts visitors. Not directly, but with parking and everything, it just isn't possible. Damn. So no Vatican? Just my luck. So what other options do we have? We could wait. Put a couple of boys on stakeout until someone visits the grave. A mourner. Perhaps with a bouquet of flowers. Maybe posies, lilies, or daffodils. Someone who stops and weeps beside this very grave. We send in an armed assault team and find out whose grave this is. That'll only work if there are any able-bodied survivors who visit. Exactly. Looks like we're gonna have to do this the new-fashioned way. Forensics. Forensics? We're going to have to get the lab boys in to look for hair samples in the casket and compare them with the hairs of every person in the whole town and look for a match. If that's the only way... Damn! Problem, sir? To do that, we need to open the grave, and that requires the permission of the next of kin. But how can we get permission if we don't know whose grave it is? You see, it's this kind of red tape that makes being a cop so damned frustrating. In the olden days, we'd bust open that grave... Grab the corpse and put the screws to him until he told us who he was. Say, detective, there is a flashlight lying right here on the ground. I could shine it on the headstone and see what name is written there. Brilliant, Kelton. Was Inspector Clay buried with his flashlight? Isn't everybody...
Shine that light, Kelton. Mother of God. It's Inspector Clay's grave. But he ain't in it. No, he ain't. At the capital city of the country this story takes place in. Come in, Edwards. You wanted to see me, General? I understand that you've been put on point for all of our so-called saucer attacks? Yes, I'm in charge of field operations, General. Understood. Listen, I'm just going to get right into it. Your reports state that you have seen some UFOs that you believe to be alien in origin? Yes, sir. Really? Yes, sir. And you've seen these UFOs with your own naked eye? Yes. Yes, sir. And you realize that there is a strict government directive that firmly states there is no such thing as a flying saucer? I understand your directive, and I understand why you want to keep it quiet, and... I may have been all for participating in this whole charade were it not for one major problem. What is that? I ordered my men and women to shoot. How can I hope to hold down my command if I didn't believe what I shot at? I like you, Colonel. I, uh, I like you too, General. There are flying saucers. I know. I know you know. I'm just confirming it. They are in our skies. Been there for some time. What are we going to do about it? We are winging our options. So they really are there? Yes. And we've had contact with them. Contact? Contact. How? When? I'm shocked. Radio. Recently. I was too. Do they speak English? Not quite. We received messages from an orbiting spacecraft. At first it just came in a bunch of jumbled noise. How do you feel about the Nazis, Edwards? Negatively, sir. And the communists? Also negatively, but in a very different way. Explain, Colonel. I hate the Nazis for what they have done, but I don't hate the commies. I I regard them skeptically and with trepidation, but sometimes I think that behind that iron curtain, they're just a bunch of hard-working schmoes like all of us. Though they are red, they may not be the devil. For the next couple of decades, I'd like to keep them at arm's length and hope that a peace will one day happen. I like that, Colonel. It's a good answer that is both very introspective and perfectly represents the zeitgeist of our era. Thank you, sir. You see, Edwards, this box on my desk is a universal translator of sorts. The Germans invented it, the Russians perfected it, and we stole it. So what? These aliens have been contacting us for centuries, but they have been doing so in their own language. We were unable to understand their messages, unable to reply. Until now. You've been in charge of saucer field activity for a long while. I think it's about time you heard these recordings, Colonel. These are extremely classified. Understood. Like, really classified. Like, classified with a capital SH. Yes, sir. As in, don't tell anyone or we'll just credit you, kill you, and discredit you again. Yes, sir. This is Eros, a space soldier from a planet in your galaxy. This is my associate and work friend, Tana. Hello. Since the beginning of time, we have been circling your planet. Permit me to put your mind at ease. We do not wish to conquer your planet. We need to speak to your leaders concerning a very serious issue. Please beam your response to coordinates Alpha 693. And this? Hello, this is Eros again, the alien. Just hoping you could get back to me about a very important matter concerning a weapon you are making. It's really urgent. Please send your response to coordinates Alpha 693. And this? Arrows here. Listen, you guys are really close to creating a devastating weapon that will destroy the whole universe. I'm not joking. Please get back to me as soon as possible. Coordinates are Alpha 693. 693. Alpha. And this? Hello, Eros. This kind of the last time I'm gonna call you. Done my part. I need to hear from you tonight or things will get pretty bad. Alpha 693. Talk to you later. Bye. And this. Hi, it's Eros again. Didn't mean to sound threatening last time, but things are pretty dire. Can you please respond like soonish? I think you have my coordinates. Sorry again. There are several more like those until I received this message a few hours ago. Hello, Earth. 
This is Eros, a galactic space soldier. You have been warned and you have not responded to our messages. You are a threat. Prepare to be destroyed. Do you think they mean business, General? We do. We believe a galactic war is at hand. We must mount a defense, Colonel. We are embarking on a historic venture of historical proportions that will go down in history. We can't take any chances and must act fast. We believe that they may have already begun a small-scale attack. Take a look at this map. You ever been there? No. That town has had many reports of saucers flying so low that the exhaust is knocking people to the ground. There are even reports of saucer landings. You are the best man for the job. Find them, contact them, and see what the hell they want. Yes, sir. I'll head there now. And, Colonel? Yes, sir. Don't you forget for one goddamn second who sent you and who it is you are representing. Yes, sir. Good luck, Colonel Edwards. Thank you, General Pickleberry. Arrows, you're many days late. What news? We have successfully risen three of their dead. This is not news. They are here. Let me see one. Bring in the big one, Tana. Your plan has been far from successful. This mission is really important. I will not fail. Everything is on our side. Your progress is too slow. Here is the big one. Impressive. Stop him, Tana! He's he's attacking me! Help! Turn him off! Help! No! I can't get it. It's jammed. This remote is a piece of shit. It works fine! It's universal! It's good for everything! Good for everything means great for nothing. Turn him off! Help! Help me! What do you suggest, Tana? One remote for each dead person? Yes. It gets too confusing! I'm dying! Labels, Eros. Use labels. Oh, God! It's too much work to label everything! A Sharpie and some masking tape, Eros. No! Stop him! Stop him! Please! I got it. Here goes. <clears throat> that was too close. <sighs> He's a fine specimen. Are they all this powerful? <clears throat> this one is an exception, Excellency. <clears throat> and the other two? One is a woman, the other is an old man. An old man, eh? An old man. This gives me a plan. Return the big one. Tana! The old one must be sacrificed. Land on Earth, send the old one to enter a dwelling, and cut the electrokinetic power. But that will kill him. Again. The result will astound anyone watching. Yes, Excellency. It will be done. Report to me when this mission is accomplished. Yes. Eros, the Earth people are getting closer to that which we would fear. As soon as you have enough of these dead recruits, march them on the capitals of the world. Let nothing stand in your way. We will use their own dead against them. We will then cease production of the ultimate weapon that is within their grasp. I am leaving. I had feared His Excellency would not have taken our report so well. His Excellency can surprise us at times. Yes, true. What do you think will be the next obstacle the Earth people will put in our way? As long as they can think, we'll have our problems. It's a good thing you're home, Jeff. This whole ordeal has been rough on your wife, who is named Paula. It's been harrowing, Detective. I'm just glad that Jeff is back home. We've kept a good watch on her, Jeff. Officer Kelton's been patrolling the graveyard non-stop. Sure have. When it comes to zombies, I'm as much of a dope as the next guy. But when it comes to serving and protecting the residents of this upper-middle-class suburban sprawl, you aren't gonna find any better than our boys in blue. I'll see who it is. Hello? Hello, Mr. Trent. Who is this? Colonel Tom Edwards, of the Army. Salvation? Uh, no, the, uh, the fighting one, with tanks and such. Ah, one moment, please. 
going to allow this colonel in. He may be here about the goings-on in the last few days, or he may be an old friend of yours. Do either of you have an old friend who's a colonel? No. Okay. He is likely here about the zombies, aliens, or both. We may be able to use his help, but I'm going to warn you, once one of these bastards from Top Army Brass gets involved, things can get muddy. Be careful what you say to him. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Trent. I'm Colonel Tom Edwards. No, silly. Mr. Trent is over there. And who are you? Municipal Police. Mrs. Trent has had a very strange and difficult night. I'm here to assist. Okay. Thank you, Detective. I'll take things from here. Beg your pardon? I was sent from the capital with strict orders to assume control of the situation. Oh, the situation is well under control. I'm sure it is, Detective. So you can hit the old dusty trail. Under control, eh? No issues? Not at all. How are you, Mrs. Trent? Good, thanks. Are you happy with your experiences? With the police, I mean, not the dead zombie. Oh, yes. With the police. Delighted. You and Officer Kelton have been great. Thank you, Mrs. Trent. There you have it. Looks like everything is rather hunky-dory. From what I've heard, there's been a rash of mysterious deaths in this town. A cop killed and singing to rise from his grave. UFOs flying overhead. Two grave diggers dying mysteriously. Strange old man zombies breaking into women's boudoirs and slowly chasing them around couches. This detective is neither hunky nor dory let alone both Hunky and Dory concurrently. Seems you are, uh, out of touch with the situation. Out of touch? Colonel, this is my town and these are my people. I live with them. I golf with them. My kids go to school with their kids. That cop that was killed, he was my ex-partner. He left me several pairs of socks in his will. I'm wearing a pair right now. If that doesn't say friendship, I don't know what does. Those UFOs are flying in the very sky that I gaze upon as I walk my dog every night. Those gravediggers were friends of mine, and when I think that someone other than those fine, hard-working folks will be digging my final resting place, my heart breaks. And when that old man zombie slowly chased this poor Mrs. Trent around her couch, who were the first people there? It was us, Colonel. The police. Where were you? Where were you? I was in the capital. Sipping your Chardonnay with the mucky mucks? Listen, Buster, if you think for one second that I'm going to step aside because some experienced and well-respected war hero with more decorations than a family of flamboyant Christmas trees waltzes in, you've got another thing coming, Cheech. We don't want you to step aside completely, Detective. We want to work with you. I'd just be the leader. You could use a break. Break? How about I break your skull? Gentlemen, I have an early flight in the morning. Can we please get on with this? Obviously, you both can be great resources to a town that cries out for much-needed aid. Colonel, I'm Jeff Trent. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Trent. I'm Colonel Tom Edwards. Pleased to meet you. And this must be Mrs. Trent. Enchanté. Avec plaisir, madame. I'd like to talk to you both about the goings-on of the past little while. We've got it all down in our report, Colonel. Feel free to come by the office and check it out. I'd like to hear it in her own words. Like I said, all in the report. All right. Mr. Trent, you were knocked down by a blast of air? Or or is that already covered in a report? No, Colonel. We didn't cover that. Funny. Thought you might have found that important. Been a busy week, Colonel. Yeah? Police force overworked? So, Mr. Trent, about that blast of air... I'm intrigued by it. Was it warm air or cold air? Does the temperature of the air really matter? Sure does, don't you think, Detective? Half of one, six dozen of another. So, Mr. Trent, was it warm air or cool air? Well, Colonel, it was neither, you see. Well, it was both. It was lukewarm. Kind of room temperature. Tepid-like. Oh, it was a vicious force. Knocked me to the ground. The light blinded me so badly, I-, I couldn't see a thing. We could only feel the force of the wind, not see it. And when the glare left, all I could see was a glowing ball flying off into the distance. Is this a round ball? Yes. It flew off toward the cemetery. This is the most fantastic story I've ever heard. 
And every word of it's true. That's a fantastic part of it. Did y'all folks hear, feel, and see that? Yeah. That normal thing around these parts? These days, ain't nothing normal around these parts, Colonel. I see that. Did you hear that, Kelton? Nope, nope nothing, sir. There's something out there. And I don't like it. And I don't like it. Jeepers Creepers, ain't this the pits? Five years and I work all the way up to Graveyard Watch. What a fine howdy-do, standing here in the middle of the night guarding a crypt. Good golly, looking for God knows what from God knows where. Who'd have thunk it? Last year I was the cop of the month for February and runner-up for June, and now this. Ain't that a kick in the teeth. Winner of Rookie Cop of the Year, twice. Heavens to Betsy, not even a stool upon which to rest. I'll be a monkey's uncle, working around the clock, and all it's going to do is put me in a higher tax bracket. Son of a gun, get Kelton to do it. He ain't got no wife. He ain't got no kids. Even his cat hates him. Nobody will miss him when he's scoping out the boneyard for days on end. Ain't that the bee's knees. Everyone else is on other cases. That dog don't hunt. This is undoubtedly the worst birthday ever. Oh. Something smells really bad. Even worse than before. It smells like... A dead fish. Covered in a cheap perfume. Made from... Old Parmesan cheese that was... Stored in an old gym sock. That was vomited on by a drunk baby. But worse... It must just be my imagination... It isn't my imagination. It's a dead old man, and he's coming right for me. Detective, I'm coming your way. Got a zombie on me. Should I sacrifice the old one now? Wait until he's in that yard with those others. We want as many people to see this as possible, and five seems like a good number. Arrows. Is it wise to willingly kill off a soldier as we are building an army? It doesn't seem so at first, Hannah, but... When you mull it over, it makes perfect sense. I don't see how, Eros. No time for mulling, Tana. Sacrifice the old one. Stay back from him, Kilton. I'm trying, detective. Now, Tana, now! just happened? I don't know. I was so filled with dread, I just closed my eyes. Damnedest thing I ever saw. He disintegrated. I'm left with a skeleton now. What do you make of that? You got me. He didn't look that way a minute ago. No, he certainly did not. What about your man? Wow, and all the confusion I forgot about Kelton. Oh, may I? I'm trained in first aid. Absolutely. Wake up. Wake up. Huh? What? We got it. I gave him everything I had, and he just kept coming. Now, unless that bag of bones can reassemble itself, it's all gone now. Detective, I don't want to do no more of that graveyard stuff. It's too spooky, too disturbing. I'm going to have nightmares. No problem, Kelton. I promise. No more graveyards. So, what now, Detective? Got to retrace the old man's steps. We'll have Kelton take us through the graveyard. The graveyard? Ah, jeez. As the chaotic, creepy capers of the chronically controlled corpses curtailed, another visitor entered the cemetery. Fancy meeting you here. <gasps> oh, hey, it's you, from the funerals. Uh, we found the bodies of those gravediggers. You startled me. <laughs> Sorry. What brings you to these parts? It's peaceful. Sure is. Figured I'd come down to the old cemetery, put my mind at ease. Coco? I have a cold. Don't want to get germs on your thermos. No problem. I never drink right from the thermos. Oh, I don't want to take your only cup. Don't be silly. I often double cup. Here. I didn't recognize you at first. You look different when you're not wearing your funeral dress. Remember that day we found the dead gravediggers? I do. Things sure have been strange since then. No kidding. Aliens, zombies, sirens at all hours of the day, top secret military transports driving up and down the streets. I just can't believe it's all happening in our little town. Yeah, I agree. 
As I was walking here, there was a corpse that disintegrated on someone's porch. Two weeks ago, if you had said that exact same thing, I'd have had you committed and lobotomized. But now, this kookiness seems sort of normal. Sure does. It's good cocoa. A little bit of vanilla in there, too. I can taste it. Oh, just a sprinkle. Am I tasting nutmeg? Maybe. It might just be my secret ingredient. But if I told you, it would no longer be a secret. Just an ingredient. (laughs) What are your thoughts? In what sense? A general sense. Until we know the why, we cannot know the what or the how. I don't follow you. This gaggle of exotic wayfarers, these migrant emigres, come here and cause great destruction. I can't just buy the idea that someone, man, beast, or extraterrestrial, would want to destroy something for no reason. More cocoa? Oh no, I'm good. I wonder if they think they're doing us a favor. You know, tearing us down so that they can build us up. They could be here to help us. Maybe they know the meaning of life. Or maybe, just maybe, it's not so lofty. Maybe they are trying to communicate something simpler, something more mundane, yet practical. Like what? I don't know. Like a more ergonomically designed light bulb, or a clean burning fuel that's been right under our noses, or maybe a a more efficient way to tie one's shoes. They may have even come to us so that we could help them with something. Maybe we have something that we're not using that they need. Would it have killed us to share? Probably not. What if they came all the way here to give us a cure for some disease, and all they wanted were our old newspapers or used coffee filters? We might be skeptical about such a good deal and refuse to cooperate. We were suspicious, they got annoyed, and things escalated. Have you ever heard the expression, don't look a gift horse in the mouth? Of course, it's from St. Jerome's letter to the Ephesians. Exactly. If we act rashly, it could mean disaster for the planet at large. Well, you are forgetting one small detail. What's that? Troy. Troy? The Greeks hid an army inside a horse and bestowed it to the Trojans who brought it behind their city walls. When the Trojans went to sleep, the Greeks jumped out of the horse and ravaged the city. What looked like a gift was actually a clever ruse that led to the downfall of Troy. If they'd been wise enough to look that gift horse in the mouth... The Trojans would have avoided a lot of peril. So much for St. Jerome. So much for St. Jerome. Look at us, two goofy kids drinking cocoa in a graveyard trying to solve the great mysteries of life. (laughs) (laughs) Ain't life a gas? I guess it's about that time. (laughs) Sure is. Good night. Good night. Where did everything happen, Kilton? Everything wacky has been pretty much centered around this point. Good work, Kilton. Yes, good work, Kilton. We must board that ship. I can't believe I'm saying this, Colonel, but I agree with you. Let's get to the bottom of this. Small numbers to gain the element of surprise. I can't believe I'm saying this, Detective, but I agree with you. Small attack team of two or three should do the trick. You, myself, and uh, Mr. Trent should have the necessary skills to best these invaders. Wait. Hold on. Why me? Why not you, Mr. Trent? I'm just a humble airline pilot. Exactly what we need. If this thing takes off, we, uh, 
We need someone with the adequate skills to land it, and you are a pilot, Mr. Trent. A pilot. No, I, I, I'm not going. My place is here with Paula, my wife. Your wife, called Paula, will be safe with Officer Kilton. Behind that bad haircut and goofy exterior is the best cop on the force. Officer Kelton is a well above average shot who has a green belt in judo. It's true, and thank you. Gentlemen, I can't. Well, Mr. Trent, you are kind of leaving us out in the cold here. We really don't have anyone else to help us out. We're old men now, me and the detective. Mr. Trent, we need someone with youth on our side. Our glory days are behind us. Did I ever tell you about my experiences during the war? No. I was a kid, scared, excited. Happy to serve, but terrified to be there. I was stationed in Finland. Our base was a commandeered ironmonger's shop that we had taken from the enemy. Our captain was a gruff but jovial man named Captain Ford. When he was killed by the enemy, we named our little fortress after him. It was our own little bastion against the unnatural element of war and the natural element of wind. Finland was beautiful. I would stare out over the ice mountains and valleys and think of how beautiful it all was, then I would remember why I was there. The war. The killing. The inhumanity. Every day was terrifying, and though I lived through a lot of hell, I never regretted for one minute, for one second, that I fought with the force at the Fort Ford Forge on the Fjord in 44. You know, Jeff, a lot of people come down on us cops. They say that we're nothing but a bunch of guys who only want to solve crime efficiently and effectively. That we only want to restore peace of mind and deter future criminal activity. But there's a lot more to us than that. We help people feel safe. I'm happy to help meet that need. But right now, Mr. Trent, I need you. You have a baby on the way. So does your wife, whose name is Paula. It isn't about you anymore. Just think about that, Jeff. Can Jeff and I have a minute alone? It'll have to be a quick one. Thank you. Jeff, I think you should go. But what about you, Paula? If you can do anything to help save the planet, I think you should. But what if I don't come back? Listen to me, Jeffrey Trent. You always do. You always come back. I'm no hero. You are my hero. You will be this baby's hero. Hero? That's poppycock, Paula. What kind of hero passes up a chance to save the world? You haven't passed up anything yet. There's still time. They are waiting. Yes, I should go. I, I must go. No more sitting around being all indecisive like a regular Casper milk toast. Colonel, detective? Yes, yes Mr. Mr. Trent. Trent. I'm coming too. Glad to hear. What changed your mind, Jeff? In this world, a man is judged by his tenacity, his guts, his balls. And if I don't take a stand, I will never again be able to look at my balls in the mirror. Couldn't have said a bit of myself. Gentlemen, it's time. Remember, Jeff, you always come back to me. I do. Take care of my wife, Kelton. Remember, Mr. Trent, Greenbelt. Are you okay, Mrs. Trent? I think I will be. Come on! The coast is clear! Lower your weapons. Sorry, I forgot to look both ways. We mean you no harm. Ah, oh, Tana. Why didn't you tell me we had company? They've just arrived. Good. I guess you've been wondering what we've been doing in your skies. And, perhaps more immediately, what we've been doing with your dead. First, Allow me to introduce myself. I am an explorer from another planet. My name is Eros, son of Gravis. This is Tana. She is my second in command. Tana, will you explain to these humans why we are here? We have been visiting your skies for centuries, and- Listen, enough of this chitter-chatter. I'm a policeman and I deal in facts. What's your story, you bunch of weirdies? You are no longer entitled to answers. You sure about that, Zeke? You do not need your guns. They will be of no use to you. They've been useful before on flesh and blood, and you look to be made of that kind of stuff. We are. The resemblance between our people is very similar. 
Perhaps that is why we have been patient with you. Perhaps we have a common ancestor. Perhaps we do, but we have certainly evolved in different ways. We are a peaceful and intelligent people, and compared to humans, our males have much larger genitalia. Isn't that true, Tana? Sure. I guess. Are we going to talk now, or would you prefer to wait? Your friends will be here shortly. What friends? We ain't got no friends. To whom do you refer? Those people you left in the graveyard. Paula and Kelton? Please, they're innocent in all of this. We can discuss- Oh, no harm has come to them. Yet. Ha 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 ha. How are you holding up, Mrs. Trent? I'm okay, officer. You? I'm doing all right. Been a long week. Every week is a long week, though. You excited for the new baby? Sure am. I envy you, Mrs. Trent. Gonna have a family and all. All I got is the force. A handsome guy like you? Yeah? For real? Heavens, yes. You're a caring and brave man with a job who looks remarkably dashing in his uniform. I also play guitar. Neat. Say, Mrs. Trent... If you find yourself, you know, widowed later tonight, maybe you and me... Nah, what a dopey thing to say. I'm sorry. I'm not always very comfortable around others, women and such. No? I guess that's what you get when you're the son of a long-haul trucker who's never home and a stripper completely devoid of self-esteem. Not that I blame my parents. I mean, Mom could handle that truck like it was a hatchback. And I'd say that your father had his talents, too. I just have trouble making friends. Well, you have one here. Me. That sure is nice of you to say. Have you seen that old man's dead wife? She sure is a cutie, considering... I mean, I understand that she is a reanimated corpse, but damn, evil just shouldn't look that good. Oh, Officer Kelton, you need to find a nice living girl. Well, I don't see how. Well, I'm sure you see women everywhere when you walk the beat. Once this thing blows over and you get back to your regular duties, you find them. Sure, I'm a good shot and an accomplished judoka, but that don't amount to a pinch of rat crap when you're around all those cops with years more experience than me. With time comes experience. With experience comes wisdom. That's right, Mrs. Trent. It's the former Inspector Clay. Stay there, Mrs. Trent. I'll fight him off. Uh, ooh, Officer ah, Kelton! Oh, Officer Kelton! Ow, stop it! Oh. Oh, oh! No! The big one has the woman. He is bringing her here. You fiend! Fiend? I'm a proud servant of my planet, and you call me a fiend? We came here with friendly intentions to help you. Oh, yeah? Enough of this beating around the bush. What's the rub? Large, catastrophic, tragic death. All of you dum-dums on Earth are idiots. We came here to help. We came here to share information that could keep you from destruction. You ignored us. You shot at us. You discredited us. What are you talking about? Earth must be destroyed before it's too late. This very vessel contains a weapon that, in a matter of mere seconds, can eliminate the Earth. Depending on your views of science and religion, somewhere between 6,000 and several billion years of progress will be gone in a heartbeat. Hold on, pal. No, you hold on, pal. First, you invent the firecracker, a harmless explosive enjoyed by bored adolescents who are too young to appreciate hash. Harmless and fun, but an explosive nonetheless. Then, you invent the hand grenade. It's a bigger explosive that is capable of killing many from a long distance. Then you devise a bomb, bigger, more powerful, and far more deadly than a larger bomb, even bigger, even more powerful, even far more deadly. Then your scientists stumbled upon the atom bomb, split the atom, and a whole country is wiped out. Then the hydrogen bomb split that atom, and a slightly bigger country is gone. There are devices that can actually explode the air itself. Humanity can already be wiped out in a matter of seconds, yet you are still researching new technologies to kill. And now you are on the brink of discovering Solaronite. Solaronite? There is no such thing. Perhaps to you, but we've known about it for centuries. And your scientists are only three or four research grants away from perfecting it. Based on your history, you will discover and use Solaronite. You will destroy the entire galaxy, perhaps the universe. 
You are way above my head. Solaronite makes light explode. Light explode? That's impossible. Rays of sunshine are minute particles. Is it not conceivable that they can do as I have suggested? These particles are too small to be seen, felt, tasted, smelled, or measured. Your people once said the same about the atom. Only a few years ago, you could not measure an atom, but now you can explode one. That would be great. Colonel, if your people could get this solaronite, we'd be an even more powerful nation than we already are. Oh, for Christ's sake, that is the problem! Stupid! Mine stupid, stupid, stupid! It is because of thoughts like his that you must be destroyed. You are too violent, headstrong, impulsive. You have no control over the mind God gave you. And now you speak of God? Is it not possible that we too believe in a higher power? Eros, we really don't have time to get into religion. True, Tana. Thank you. Solaronite is the most devastating weapon imaginable. All it would take is one fool in power with a corrupted mind and or a twitchy finger to destroy the whole universe. Once the device is activated, sunlight becomes a flammable material, like gasoline. If ignited, the flame follows the light all the way back to the source, the sun. The sun would explode, and anywhere that is touched by the light of that explosion would be vaporized. How dangerous is a weapon that turns light into fuel? Only the blind would survive. What makes you think we will be so stupid? Why would we ever use this Solaronite? You are a soldier. You wear the uniform of a country that you were sworn to protect. What do you protect against? Invaders, terrorists, smugglers. You are a municipal police officer, sworn to serve and protect. Who do you serve, and from what do you protect them? Crime. Be more specific. Local bank fraud of funds under $200. Elderly shoplifters from convenience stores. Tricycle thieves. Be slightly less specific. Murder, thievery, and kidnapping. And you, Mr. Trent, you are here as you feel the need to protect your family. It's the duty of the head of the household. From what do you protect? Many of the same things we protect against. He can answer for himself. There have been enough redundancies since we got on board this bucket of bolts. Have an army of ducks ever invaded your country and attempted to seize control of your government? No. Has an otter ever offered you an amazing investment opportunity but needed you to give him $500 in cash first to secure the deal? Of course not. Has a burrow ever broken into your home and stolen your wife's jewelry? No. Who does all this crazy stuff? Who are you required by contract or custom to protect yourself against? Other people. Interesting. You are a living race that harms itself to the point that several industries have been established to prevent the damage you do to yourselves. You call it a war crime, but ultimately it's one person or group of people harming another. You have gotten to the point where you have already wiped out many cultures and species. You have destroyed your own planet beyond any true repair, and now you stand on the brink of controlling a weapon that will have the power to destroy the entire universe. A universe that is inhabited by bajillions of species just as important as yourselves. Go on! I want you to think about that. Really think about that. I'm going outside for a smoke. While I'm gone, take a minute to see this from someone else's view. Use what little bits of empathy remain in your stupid brains, weak hearts, and puny genitals to think. Does it not make sense to eliminate you now before you have the chance to destroy everything? Gentlemen, I hate to say it, but he's right. We've never invented a weapon that we didn't, at the very least, intend to use. I don't see why we would. Can we trust ourselves to have the means to destroy the universe and not use it? I really don't think so, Colonel. What do you think, Mr. Trent? <clears throat> <clears throat> Oh, what well, happened? I don't remember swooning. What happened, Mrs. Trent? Mrs. Trent? Mrs. Trent! Mrs. Trent? Oh, I better clean myself up before the detective comes back. My uniform is covered in this dirt and this clay. Clay? 
Inspector Clay. Inspector Clay slugged me. He clubbed me right in the mush. Ah, it's the second time tonight that I've been bopped on the melon, and I'm getting pretty darn tired of it. Wait, holy cow, there he is, with Mrs. Trent. I hope it isn't too late. Clay is dead. How am I going to kill someone who's already dead? There he stands. Ah, this is too much. I need some help trying to understand all this death stuff. Where's Plato when you need him? To heck with the whole thing. I'm going home, getting some well-deserved sleep. The, the shovel. You, you must use the shovel. I don't know what you mean. Officer Kelton, the shovel. Hit him in the head with the shovel. What? Pick up the gravedigger's shovel and take a few steps. Wind up your arms and hit him in the head or back with it as if you were swinging at a a baseball or or beating a dusty rug over a a railing or a step or clothesline. Uh, The the trauma of the strike will daze him enough for me to regain consciousness and fall. Then we can run away. It's the only hope we have of survival. Yeah, I'll hit him with a shovel. Yeah, I'll hit him with a shovel. You saved me. I did? I did. But the idea was all yours, Mrs. Trent. It was teamwork and cooperation. Teamwork and cooperation. We better get out of here before he wakes up. I understand your point, Mr. Trent. We are faced with the option of saving ourselves or saving the universe. Individual needs versus that of the collective. Never an easy decision. I think, though, it loathes me to say it, we must sacrifice ourselves for the good of the universe. Have you gone mad? Not at all. I'm as sane as a lamppost. Scientific curiosity will cause our scientists to discover this weapon. Our engineers and crafters will build it out of a love for working with their hands and producing a tangible product. The lust for power and money will cause our leaders to possess the weapon and eventually use it. We can't let that happen. We need to think of others. Colonel, you've got a point. Let's get that silly space monkey in here and ask if they'll make it quick and painless. Do you have a device that can allow me to address the citizens of Earth? Yes. We call it an intercom. May I use this, uh, this intercom? Yes, it is this button, right here. I push it to talk? Yes, hold it in till you are done, then let go. Thank you. What are you doing? The least I can do is warn everyone. (sighs) Citizens of Earth, my name is Colonel Tom Edwards. I'm speaking to you from a control room in a giant spaceship. Recent circumstances have shown that our home planet must be destroyed in order to save the galaxy. There are only 15 minutes remaining until everything we know is gone. Ten. What? Ten minutes. Ten minutes until everything we know is gone. I suggest you find someone. Anyone. Find a friend you adore or a stranger who needs some company. Find that Serbian lady whose name you can't pronounce that works at the convenience store. Take her hand and say, I think I love you and judging by your letters, I know you feel the same. Never mind your overbearing husband who treats you poorly. To hell with tradition. Let's one more time with mutual consent go behind the freezers and enter the divine rapture that can only be found during that special carnal embrace. Let us attain a physical and emotional climactic bliss as we are instantly vaporized. I know that's what I would do. Thank you, and Godspeed, planet Earth. I ask you, Eros, one last time to reconsider this. This planet doesn't deserve to be destroyed. Deserves? Deserves? Who deserves to be attacked? What deserves to be eradicated? Why does anything deserve to be mistreated? Yet, you people do it all the time. Logically... Logic? To hell with logic! Don't you people have emotions? Emotions are stupid. You can emote until my gigantic privates turn purple, and it still won't save your planet. 
Is it time, Eros? It is time, Tana. What is that loud noise? Oh, uh, we are taking off. There's no way we'd remain on Earth as it blew up. And now we will spend the next 8 minutes and 32 seconds standing here, watching you as you watch your home planet explode. There is nothing you can do to stop us. We will destroy your planet, and the records will show that Eros and Tana, in that order, were responsible for ridding the galaxy of a selfish and reckless race. Officer Kelton, the ship is taking off. You've got to do something. Like what, Mrs. Trent? Shoot the motor out. I can't, Mrs. Trent. I can't. You can, Officer Kelton. You can. I believe in you. I appreciate that, Mrs. Trent, but I can't. I'm out of ammo. Oh, no. Godspeed, you brave warriors. I'm having no issues flying this plane by myself, but I really miss Jeff's company. What in the heck is that? A flying saucer. Edie, you better get up here. What's up, Denny? That's the flying saucer again. It looks like it's glowing. You don't think it's charging up a weapon, do you? Not sure, Edie, but we can't take any chances. Let's get in touch with Burbank Tower and see if they can scramble some fighters. There isn't time, Denny. We gotta do something. But what? We have some heat-seeking missiles. Just in case. Whoa! Of course! The red button that sent out the missiles! We'll shoot the bird down! Excellent! Ready, aim... Wait! You don't think Jeff is on there with two other men? My god! He might be. I can't blow my best friend out of the sky! We gotta do something! You can always use the spare parachutes! Shoots, shoots! We keep it back, back, back... Of, of course. course! Listen, Edie. I've got to pilot this thing. How's your throwing arm? I throw like a girl. So, you typically have less power than a man, but much better accuracy. Exactly. I'm going in close. I'll grab the chutes. Good luck, Denny. Good luck, Edie. Wait, I totally forgot. I have a crossbow strapped to my back and plenty of arrows for both of us. I know you don't have a bow, but maybe if you just throw the arrows, they'll do something. Great! Parachutes are away. Nice shot, Edie. Parachutes? What good are parachutes if you have nowhere to parachute to? It is almost admirable that in your final moments, you and your friends are trying to save yourselves. Selfishly struggling for survival, as ever. Arrows, there's two people in the graveyard aiming weapons at us. And a commercial airliner coming right for us. Ah! <laughs> I'll just go to the steering console and evade their attacks. As long as I can steer this, there will be no problems. Hold your horses, Eros. I have no horses. Your shoe's untied. Thank you for telling me. Very kind of you, considering the circumstances. Ow! You punched me? That was low! Eros, get up. I need you to steer while I do everything else. Everyone got their shoots on? Yes. Sure do. Let's blow this joint. Eros. Eros. You ready, officer? Sure am. Fire! Ugh! Ugh. Suck on this, you sucky suckers. Who suck? Sure are nice parachutes, gents. Sure are. All that time talking and all we needed to do was give that Eros guy an old-fashioned smack in the old chops. 
Well done, Mr. Trent. Absolutely. I went in all headstrong, but it was all just bluster. Took a real hero to pop that guy one. Thank you, Detective. I'll never forget your selflessness and dedication, Mr. Trent. I wish every man in my command was exactly like you. From up here, the world sure is beautiful. It's beautiful from wherever you look, Detective. We sure got a nice planet. Hey, Mr. Trent, there's your plane. You're awfully quiet all of a sudden, Mr. Trent. Got anything to say? Woo! I'm coming back to you, Paula. Coming back to you. <laughs> what is love? Love is an emotion that people feel when they really, really like something. Be it another person, a certain dish, a book, a movie, or a whole planet. These two found love in the unlikeliest circumstances, as mourners at several funerals. Their story is one that shows, no matter how bleak things may seem, happiness could be right around the corner. And with that, the vows. Excuse me, this is a good time? General, General Pickleberry. Huh? Huh? Hello? We are in the middle of a wedding, General. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just stand over here. No, General, go ahead. We can get married when you're done. Yes, please. We can wait. On behalf of the citizens of Earth, I have a few people to thank for their heroic deeds. I have five awards of merit to present to five heroes who selflessly defended the planet from an unknown enemy. Aliens. They have shown to the universe what we humans have known for centuries. We may be a very cliquish and clannish group who will fight amongst ourselves, but when push comes to shove, when something new threatens us or scares us, we will happily band together. For years we have shown that we will protect our families from others, our town from others, our countries from others, and now we have proven that we will also protect our world from others. These five brave souls come from all walks of life. A soon-to-be father, a decorated colonel, a plucky detective, an inexperienced and unsure patrolman with a green belt in judo, and a coke-addled commercial co-pilot saved everything that we know and hold dear. I could not think of a more worthy group of recipients of the Golden Valor Braveness and Sacrifice Award Medal. It has also come to my attention that two others have helped in this endeavor. Paul and Edie, for your support of our boys in their hour of need, please accept my heartfelt kudos. Your pretty smiles make it all worthwhile, girls. Now I know that many of you are wondering if we are still developing the Salaronite weapon. And all I can say is that information is classified. Do you mind, Reverend? Not at all. And with the power invested in me by all the bastards up at Top Army Brass, you may kiss the bride. Everyone, the reception will take place as soon as we all get to the community hall. Let's go! Paula! Jeff, I've missed you. I've missed you. I have someone I'd like you to meet. This is our son. A son? I have a son? Yes. He was born right after I shot down the spaceship. Officer Kelton delivered him. Sure did, Mr. Trent. Well, how do you like that? Hey, Jeff. What do you say you get back in that plane of ours and fly a bunch of people to their desired destinations in a safe and timely manner? I think I'm going to need a little time before I do that again, Denny. How about tomorrow? Well, it looks like I got an empty night with no plans. Edie? Yeah, Denny? We going on a date or I got to find me a brothel somewhere? Oh, Denny. You always know exactly what to say. You did a lot of good work, Tilton. I think I'm going to promote you right now. No regulation, no paperwork, no documented justification whatsoever. Wow, thanks, Detective. Excuse me, officer. Yes? 
My identical twin sister recently passed away. Perhaps you knew her. She was married to an old man. Yes, I do. I'm so sorry. That's okay. We weren't so close. I'm not broken up about it. I just figured I'd come to town to see her grave. You know, you seem to be a nice, honest man. Would you ever consider going to dinner with me? I sure would. That's great. I'll just go say my goodbyes, and then we can go. Sounds swell. Wow, this is the greatest day of my life. Kelton, word just came over the radio. Your house burned down. Oh. General, nothing went according to plan, but we still pulled it off. I knew you were the right man for the job, Edwards. Good work. Oh, General, I'd like to introduce you to someone. Detective? Yes? General, this is my friend, the detective. Friend? Me? Yeah, I guess so. And a friend of Colonel Edwards is a friend of mine. I'm glad we are all friends here. Come on, guys, the reception's starting. Let's go, come on. Come on, guys. Wait, people of Earth, I am the leader of the alien race that visited you. We will not be attacking anytime soon, but we will return someday. Perhaps not for hundreds of years? One day we will return, and you will regret it. So what? But what of future generations? What of them? They will deal with you as we have. Have you not heeded our warnings? I've heeded nothing! You truly are a lost people. We're happy right now. Isn't that enough? Yeah, piss off. Good one, Reverend. Stop ruining my wedding, you stupid alien leader. Yeah, screw this guy. Let's go to our reception. Hey, wait. Uh, Mr. Leader? Ah, you were the one called Jeff Trent. What is it? There's nothing you've said about us that is untrue. We are greedy and impulsive. We are destructive. This world is a fragile place, and we know humans are essentially an infestation to our planet. We simply don't care. Some of us do, but most of us don't. That's just our little way. Any desire to make this world a better place is weighed against making things easier, quicker, or more profitable. The colonel, the detective, and I eventually agreed with Eros, but we weren't going to let our planet be destroyed as long as there were people and things down there that we liked. I worked too hard to pay for my house, my car, my stereo to let someone else destroy it. No matter how just his reasons may be, Nobody was taking my shit away. You realize your actions will eventually destroy everything. Yes, I do. And the survival of this planet will be the ruination of all that exists. As long as I'm already dead when you blow the place up, I'm fine with that. You get me? You have been gotten. So what now, Mr. Trent? Well, could dwell on my own mortality, or the large-scale mortality of the planet... I could join those who caution against our wasteful and warmongering ways and endeavor to make a better world. One day I will face my impending death, and one day my descendants will stare annihilation in the face, but those are thoughts for another time. There is a wedding to go to, so tonight I eat, I drink, I mingle, I dance. My friends, you have seen this incident based on sworn testimony. Can you prove that it didn't happen in the future? Perhaps on your way home you will pass someone in the dark, and you will never know it, for they will be from outer space. Many scientists believe that another world is watching us this moment. We once laughed at the horseless carriage, the aeroplane, the telephone, the electric light, vitamins, radio, and even television. And now some of us laugh at outer space. God help us in the future.
Plan 9 from Outer Space, the audio play, featured Michael G. McDonald as the narrator, Matt Tufts as the minister, Kevin McNeil as Gravedigger and Mac, Wayne McKay as Gravedigger and Jackson, Dan Roy as Denny, Robin McKittrick as Jeff, Heather Beresford as Edie, Allie House as Mourner 1, Wesley J. Colford as Mourner 2, Ashley McLeod as Paula, Mark Penny as The Detective, Chili Morrison as Inspector Clay, Dan Bray as Kelton, Eric Bond as Police Officer, Kevin Morrison as Police Officer, Matt Campbell as Colonel Edwards, Jen Tubbert as Tana, Terence Murphy as Eros, Daniel Morrison as The Leader, Rebecca Curry as The Old Man's Wife's Twin Sister, and James F.W. Thompson as General Pickleberry. This production was directed and adapted from Ed Wood's 1956 film of the same name by Keith Morrison and was presented by Lion's Den Theatre. For more information and upcoming Lion's Den productions, please join our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Lion's Den Theatre. Theatre is spelled with R-E because that is how it's done with style. Follow us on Twitter at Lion's Den Theater or subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm your announcer, Jack Ward, from the Mutual Audio Network and Electric Vicuna Productions. And from everyone here at Lion's Den, stay healthy, stay happy, and stay safe. Good night. Archie has been brought to you by Smith's Premium Franks. Now in a new cellophane wrapper. Tender beef, juicy pork, known from the West Coast to New York. That's right, kids. You really know what you're getting when you ask for Smith's Premium Franks. Made fresh daily in Smith kitchens from coast to coast. So you know they're fresh. Made by Smith's. So you know they're top quality. Ask for them today. Smith's Premium Franks and the new handy one-pound cellophane package. It's all meat. No bones, no waste. An economical, flavorful meat that the whole family will enjoy. Smith's Premium Cook Specialty is just the thing for family holiday luncheons and snacks. For a meal in a flash that saves plenty of cash, get Smith's Premium Table Ready Meats. It's the meat with the meat in it. Lion's Den Theater is pleased to present the Archie Andrews Radio Show. Brought to you by the magic of cell phones, tablets, and laptops. This production was recorded during a period of social isolation, restriction, and distancing, and compiled for your enjoyment by Lion's Den Theater. This production features Adrian Collins, Jonathan Collins, Christine Daniels, Allie House, Ian Morrison, Mark Penny, and Jen Tibert. And now, from Moncton to Halifax to Cape Breton Island, we are pleased to bring you the Archie Andrews Radio Show. had to be more mannerly if he asked someone to pass the cake to him <laughs> he replied oh mommy what does manners get you <laughs> every time daddy gets polite on the train or bus it costs him his seat <laughs> Fred uh, yes dear the telephone's ringing I hear it well answer it well Mary I'm reading my Fred Yes, dear, I'll answer it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Andrews. Uh, yes? This is Veronica. Is Archie home? Oh, hello, Veronica. Yes, Archie's home. Did you want to talk to him? No, I don't. All right, I'll call him. <clears throat> you don't? Archie was supposed to come over this afternoon at 3 o'clock, but ask him to make it 4 o'clock instead. Yes, 4 o'clock instead. I'm going down to Stacy's department store to do some Christmas shopping this afternoon. And this is about the last chance I'll have. All right, Veronica. I'll tell him. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Oh, but don't tell him that I'm going shopping. <laughs> you see, it's for his present. <laughs> Just tell him the part about changing the date from three to four. All right, Veronica. I'll tell him. Thanks ever so much, Mr. Andrews. Bye. Bye. Bye, George. It's a good thing Veronica called. 
I'd forgotten all about Christmas shopping, and I still don't have anything for Mary or Archie. I'd better get my hat and get down to Stacy's right now. Ooh, this is the last chance I'll have. Oh, fine. Fred? Yes, dear? The doorbell's ringing. I heard it, dear. I heard it. Oh, all right, dear. Oh, good grief. Jughead. Who'd you expect? Jersey Joe Walcott? <laughs> no, Jughead, and I don't want to fight with you either. I'm in a hurry. I... Oh. Gee, hiya, Jug. What are you doing here? Oh, hi, Archie. I came over to see what you're doing. Well, I was just... Oh, Archie. Veronica just called. Oh, gee whiz. She did? Yes, Archie, she did, and she said... Gee, I never heard the phone ring. Well, it rang, and Veronica well, said... Well, why didn't you tell me? Archie. Yes, Dad? Do you care to hear what Veronica said or not? Well, sure, Dad, sure. Then be quiet and I'll tell you. Okay, Dad, okay. She said to, uh... To, to, uh... Oh, yeah. She said to change your appointment with her from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. From 3 to 4? Yes, an hour later. Gee whiz, I wonder why. Well, she had some things to attend to and I'm going out. I'll see you later. Yeah, okay, Dad. Goodbye. Bye, Mr. Andrews. Gee whiz, that's great. Huh? Now that Veronica's made our date an hour later, I have time to get my Christmas shopping done. But I... This is practically the last chance I'll have. But I... It's a good thing I thought of it. But I... I haven't bought a thing for anyone yet. Including me? Including you. Archie, it's time you did your Christmas shopping. That's right, Jug. Well, what are you going to get me, huh? Come on, we'll go right down to Stacy's. Fred? Fred? The telephone's ringing. Fred? Fred? Fred, can't you answer when I call? I think that's more... Th well, that's funny. He's gone. Oh, for pity's sake. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Andrews? This is Betty. Oh, hello, dear. How are you? Fine, thanks, Mrs. Andrews. Um, is Archie home? Oh, yes, dear. I think he's upstairs. Oh, Archie! Archie! Hmm, that's funny. He must have gone out, too. Oh, I wish people would tell me when they're going out. Hello, Betty? Yes, Mrs. Andrews? Archie doesn't seem to be home, dear. Oh, he isn't? No, dear. And Betty, oh, I hate to cut you short, but I have to run now. I'm just leaving to do my Christmas shopping. Oh, golly. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mrs. Andrews. I haven't done my shopping yet, either. Oh, you haven't? Well, would you like to go with me, dear? Oh, I'd love to, Mrs. Andrews. All right. I'll pick you up right away, and we'll go down to Stacy's. Gee whiz, Archie. I never saw such crowds. Yes, Jughead. But when we got in that elevator and everyone started pushing, did you have to push back? And that crowd even a sardine would have pushed back. Well, never mind. We're here now, and the first thing I want to buy is a compact for Veronica. I wonder where the cosmetic department is. Cosmetic department? Yeah. Gee whiz, Archie. Let's go up to the toy department first. Jug, I told you we'll go to the toy department later. Now come on. I'll ask the floor walker where the cosmetic department is. Gee whiz. Okay. Oh, uh, ma'am? Uh, yes, yes. Could you tell me where the cosmetic department is, please? Yes, counter seven. Thank you. Come on, Jug. Where is it? Counter seven. Where is that? Gee, I don't know. Oh, ma'am? Yes? W where is counter seven? On the north side of counter six. Oh, thank you. I'll just, uh, uh ma'am. Well, what now? Which way is north? Oh, my lands. Sonny, you see the boys' clothing department right there? Yes. Well, go right down to the aisle where the dummies are and turn right. Oh, okay, ma'am. 
Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Right down the next aisle. Jug, come on. Okay. Oh, what was that? You bumped into that dummy. Oh, gee whiz, I knocked the hat off. Oh, for a minute, I thought that dummy was a real person. Wait a sec, Jug, while I put the hat back on. Okay. If that floor walker ever saw me fooling around with this dummy, she'd probably throw us out of the store or something. Gee whiz. What's the matter? There's Veronica. Veronica? Oh, gee whiz. I don't want her to see me here. She's coming right toward us. Oh, boy. Jug, I'm going to be a dummy. Huh? I'm going to climb up on the platform with the rest of these dummies and I'll... I'll wear this hat. But, Archie, you can't do that. Oh, Jug, don't argue. Don't argue. Uh, Here, how do I look? You're the most natural-looking dummy I ever saw. (sighs) Don't be funny, Jug, and put that price tag on me quick. Okay. Here. Atta boy. Now remember, don't give me away no matter what happens. Well, okay, but... Shh! (laughs) Why, Jughead? Oh, hi, Veronica. What y'all doing here? Oh, just a little shopping. Oh, I am too. Thank goodness I have most of it done. Oh, that's good. Only thing I still have to get is a gift for Archie. Archie? Uh Uh-huh. I don't know what to get him. He's such a problem. (laughs) Uh, yeah, he sure is. I can't get him a book or anything because he's not the intelligent type. <laughs> I can't get him a baseball glove or anything because he's not much of an athlete. <laughs> can't get him a tie or anything because he just doesn't know anything about style. <laughs> In fact, sometimes I think Archie is an awful dummy. <laughs> but... Then again, with prices being what they are, there isn't very much you can get for a dollar. Did you say something, Jughead? Me? Not a word, Veronica. Not a word. Oh. Well, I better go get some more shopping done. I'll run along then. Bye now, Jughead. Bye, Veronica. Bye! Okay, dummy. You can relax now. A fine thing. A fine thing! Uh, Jughead! Help me off this platform. Gee whiz, not now. Huh? Here comes the floor walker. Yes, oh boy, I better be a dummy some more. Yes, ma'am. Oh me, never have I seen such a rush. Never in all my land's sake. Well, who put that dummy here? Oh boy. That isn't the silliest looking dummy I've ever seen. I don't know why that stockroom can't send one that looks at least half alive. I have never seen one with such an insipid expression. Oh, it's such ridiculous posture. Ma'am? Yes? I'm... I'm really not a dummy. That makes absolutely no difference. They still should... Oh, good heavens, you're alive. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, for pity's sake, young man, come down off there. (sighs) Yes, ma'am. Well, just what were you doing on that platform, looking like a dummy? Well, that's a long story, ma'am. You see, I... Oh, good heavens, young man. Will you do me a favor? Yes, ma'am? As soon as you've paid for that jacket, leave the store. Huh? I said as soon as you finished buying that jacket. This jacket? Yes, that jacket with the price tag on it. You're buying it, aren't you? But this is my jacket. Your jacket. Hmm. Do you have the sales slip? Well, no. I bought it here last year. And you haven't removed the price tag yet? Remove the price? Oh, ma'am. You don't understand. Young man, I understand perfectly. The price is fourteen ninety-five, and I want it right now. Oh, But, ma'am... Now, I said. But you don't understand. This is my own jacket. No fooling, Jughead. Tell this woman this is my jacket. Jughead? Young man, are you calling me names? Oh, no, 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 ma'am. I was talking to my friend. (laughs) What friend? Well, that's just it. He was here a minute ago. Gee whiz. I bet he went up to the toy department. Ma'am, if you just come up to the toy department, we can find my friend, and he'll tell you that... Young man, I'm not going to the toy department or... Anywhere else, until I have the $14.95 for that jacket. But that's all the money I have, and I just... Oh, wait a minute. Beg pardon? I know. Ma'am, if I paid you for this jacket, you'd give me a sales slip. Then I could take it over to the exchange department and get my money back. Couldn't I? Yes. Well, in that case, it's all right. I haven't anything to worry about. Here's the money. And here's your sales slip. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Good day, sir. Good day. Ha, guess I fooled her. Yes, sir, and it's a good thing I think fast. 
For a minute there, it looked like I wouldn't have any Christmas money. But now, all I have to do is take this coat, and I go to the exchange counter, and I give them this jacket, and then I'll just... Oh, gee whiz. If I do, I won't have a jacket left. Oh, boy, how do I get into these things? Well, now, let's see. First thing I'd better do is get that bottle of perfume for Mary. Ah, here's the perfume canter right here. Let's see now, what kind should I get her? Well, they certainly have quite an assortment. Chase me, $25. Hide and seek, $32. Wallflower no more, $40. <laughs> I never smelled anything worth that kind of money. Oh, here's another one. Evening in Riverdale, ten dollars. Well, that's a little better. <laughs> oh, I, I think Mary likes this perfume. That's just what I'll get her. Oh, miss. Oh, uh, I'll take this bottle and... Gee whiz. Mr. Andrews. Well, hello, Jughead. What are you doing here? Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Andrews. I'm looking for Archie. I thought you were with Archie. Well, I was... But he just kinda... Well, I'm trying to get one of these sales girls to wait on me here, but they're all so busy. He whiz. Whoa, what's the matter? There's Mrs. Andrews. Mary? Where? Right over there. Oh, good grief. If she sees me with this bottle of perfume, she'll know what I'm getting her for Christmas. She's coming this way. Yes, I know, I see. I'll just duck this bottle in my pocket there, right in this pocket. Just a moment, please. I saw that. Huh? Saw what? Oh, 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 now, now, ma'am, you don't understand. You don't understand at all, I... Oh, I don't, don't I? No, you... Did you, or did you not, just hide a bottle of perfume in your pocket? Well, yes, but... Have you paid for it? Well, no, but... Well, I don't know what you call it, but we call it shoplifting. Yes, of course, uh, shoplifting... I, uh, oh, oh, no, 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 now wait a minute, ma'am. I, uh, I can explain. I can explain the entire thing. Mm hmm. I'm listening. Well, you see, I'd been trying to get one of these sales girls to wait on me, and I just saw my wife over there, and I hid the bottle because I didn't want her to know what I was getting her for Christmas. Mm hmm. And just where is your wife? Well, she was right over. Right over. Oh, good heavens, she's gone. Yeah, I thought so. Oh, but she was right there. Jughead. Tell the lady how he saw my wife. Uh, oh. Who? Well, now, where did he go to? Uh, Mr. Jughead. He was standing right there just a second ago. I don't know where he... Do you imagine these things very often? Huh? Imagine what? Do you have delusions? But I... Dizzy spells? Oh, but I... Do you see spots before your eyes? Ah, oh, but he was just right here, and I, now he's gone. I don't know where he went, but... Oh. Now keep calm, keep calm. No need to get excited. Just give me back the bottle of perfume and we'll forget the whole thing and you can go right home and lie down. Lie down? But who wants... The perfume, please. Yes, ma'am. I have it right in my... Right in my... Oh, uh-oh. Something wrong? It leaked. What leaked? Perfume bottle. It leaked all over my pocket. See, it's... It's half empty. <laughs> oh, for land's sake. Well, now you'll have to pay for it. What? No, oh, that's right. I was going to forget the whole incident, but I can't return a damaged bottle to the counter. Well, I'm certainly not going to pay for a leaky bottle of perfume. Mister, if you're not satisfied with the item, you can take it to the exchange department. But it must be paid for. Oh, me, you win. But how I get into these things, I'll never know. I'll go to the exchange department. <laughs> Which bathrobe do you like best, Betty? Um, the dark blue one, I think. I do, too. Blue is Aunt Hattie's favorite color. Oh, but is it her size, Mrs. Andrews? Well, there's only one way to tell, Betty. I'll have to try it on. Try it on? Uh-huh. I wear the same size as Aunt Hattie does. And if it fits me, it'll fit her. Hold my coat, dear, while I step into this dressing room and put this bathrobe on. Oh, all right, Mrs. Andrews. It'll just take me a second, dear. I'd hate to have to go through all the trouble of buying this and sending it to Hattie 
and then having it not fit. Uh huh. And then I don't have to return it for her since she lives out of town. Oh, oh dear. What is it? There's no hanger in here for my dress. Oh, well, hand it to me, Mrs. Andrews. I'll hold it. All right, dear. Here you go. I have it. Oh, thank you, dear. There. Uh, how's it look, Betty? Um, well, it looks a little big to me. Oh, Betty, you don't have to hold my coat and dress. Just put them on that empty rack. Oh, all right, Mrs. Andrews. Now let's see. Hmm. Oh, yes, it is a little big. I'll have to ask the sales girl if she has a smaller size. You wait here, Betty. Oh, miss. Miss, do you have a... Gee whiz. Betty. Jughead, what are you doing here? Looking for Archie. Archie? Is he here? Well, I think so. We came here together, but we got separated. Uh, well, where'd you see him last? On the dummy platform. What? Well, you see, he was being a dummy. What? Jug, what are you talking about? A dummy. You know, the kind that looks like this? <laughs> Excuse me, miss. I gotta move this rack. What? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Jughead, what are you trying to tell me about Archie? Betty, it's an awful long story. All I want to know is, have you seen him? No, I haven't. Then I better keep looking. He may be in trouble. What kind of trouble? I can't tell you now, Betty. See you later. But Jug, wait. Jug? Oh, golly. That Jughead, he is the strangest person. Betty, how do you like this bathrobe? Oh, that's fine, Mrs. Andrews, but I just... This size does fit much better, doesn't it, dear? Yes, Mrs. Andrews, but I... I... I just... Betty, what happened to it? What happened to what? The rack! What rack? The rack you put my dress on! Oh, golly, I... I don't know. But my... my dress... my dress and my coat were on it! Oh, golly, it was here a minute ago. But, Betty, what'll I do? Was something wrong, madam? Yes, I lost my dress. I beg your... I beg your pardon? My dress! We put it down here for a minute while I tried on this bathrobe, and now it's gone. The bathrobe? No, the dress. But it couldn't be. But it is. Isn't it, Betty? Oh, yes indeed, Mrs. Andrews. Oh? Oh, my land, I have never seen such a day. Living dummies, men hiding from their wives, and now this woman loses her dress. But I tell you, it was right under my nose. I should hope so. Do something. Uh, now, madam, be calm, be calm. It was probably taken by mistake, and it will be turned in to the lost and found department. Well, where's that? At the other end of the floor, next to the exchange department. Come on, Betty. We'll go see if they have my dress. But, madam, certainly not in our bathrobe. Well, certainly not without it. How these things happen to me, I'll never know. Archie? Yes, Jug? Now can I tell you who I met? Yes, Jug. Archie, what in tarnation are you doing here? Gee whiz, Dad! Where'd you come from? Never mind where I came from. What? Archie, what are you doing standing here in your shirt sleeves? Well, Dad, I can explain. You see, I came over... Fred Andrews, what are you doing here? Mary, what are you doing in your bathrobe? It's not my bathrobe, it's... You smell! What?! You positively reek of perfume. Oh. Now whose perfume is that? Well, you see, my dear... Archie Andrews, what are you doing here? <gasps> Veronica! Jughead, why didn't you tell me Archie was here? Well, Veronica, I was... Seems to be the trouble here. Oh, the floor walker. Ma'am, I'm trying to find out why my son is standing here in his shirt sleeves well, and... Well, please, there's no need to get... And I want to know why you smell of perfume. Lady, I... And what are you doing in that bathroom? Mr. Please don't... And I'm trying to exchange my own coat. Sonny, just... So when did you get here, Archie? Why are you all so excited? You know, I was simply came down here to try and find my dress and coat. Quiet! That's better. Now, listen to me. This nonsense has gone far enough. Too far, in fact. Yes, yes Mr. Dear. Andrews. All afternoon, you people have made my life quite miserable for me. Quite miserable. Now, if there's any reason for it, I feel I'm entitled to an explanation. Well, ma'am, 
You know the coat? The one you thought I was buying? Yes. Well, my mother and father and Jughead and Veronica can all identify it as my old coat. Why, of course that's Archie's coat. My goodness, yes. I know that's his coat. Oh, dear. You mean it really is? Yes, and maybe you'll recall you didn't believe my wife was in the store when I hid the perfume bottle in my pocket. Well, yes, I... This is my wife. Oh, how do you do? I'm very sorry. Gee whiz, Betty! I just found out that two of your men moved an empty rack while I was talking to Jughead here. Didn't they, Jughead? Sure they did. And that was the rack that had my dress and coat on it. Well, Madam Floor Walker, what do you say to that? Yeah, what do you say to that? Uh, people, please, please, please. <laughs> no tempers, please. No tempers, no tempers. The customer's always right at J. Alfred Stacy's. We'll make amends, we'll make amends. <laughs> well, mistakes will happen, you know. <laughs> A young man... Since that does seem to be your own coat, you may keep it, and I'll give you a cash credit slip for what you paid me. Thank you. And you, sir. Yes? I'll be glad to give you another bottle of perfume. Compliments of the store. Well, that's better. I'm sure we can find your dress and coat in the lost and found department. And you may keep that bathrobe at no charge. I'm here, too. Jug, shut up. Well, people, uh, that satisfy you? Well, yes, I think that straightens everything out all right. I'm sorry there's been so much of a misunderstanding. That's quite all right. And now, folks, if everything's settled, let's stop hiding from each other and get this Christmas shopping done once and for all. Yes, Dad. All right, now I... What was that? Five o'clock. Thank heavens, store's closing. You folks will all have to come back next Monday. You mean we have to go through all this again? Gee whiz. The Archie Andrews Radio Show. Ian Morrison as Fred, Ali House as Mary, Jen Tabert as Veronica, Jonathan Collins as Archie, Mark Penny as Jughead, Andrea Collins as Betty, and Christine Daniels as the Floorwalker. With special vocal contributions by Rebecca Curry, Sarah Morrison, and Elizabeth Morrison. The script was originally produced by the National Broadcasting Corporation and aired on December 13, 1947. This recreation was directed by Keith Morrison and was presented by Lion's Den Theatre. For more information and upcoming Lion's Den productions, please join our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Lion's Den Theatre. Follow us on Twitter at Twitter at Lion's Den Theatre or subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm your announcer, Dan Roy, and from everyone here, stay healthy, stay happy, and stay safe. And that's this week's performance from the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. All productions, features, characters and scripts presented in the Playhouse belong strictly to their respective copyright holders and no copyright infringement is assumed or intended. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is part of the Sonic Society and a proud member of the Mutual Audio Network and any shows that continue their run must receive express permission from all parties involved. Join us next week for another classic performance. For our announcer, Jack Ward, I'm your host, David Alt. Good night. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. There are many things that we can all do that may help stop the spread of the coronavirus. But one thing we can all do is to have a plan in case you do get sick. First, consult with your health care provider for more information about monitoring your health for symptoms suggestive of COVID-19. Second, stay in touch with others by phone or email. 
You may need to ask for help from friends, family, neighbors, community health workers, or more if you become sick. And finally, determine who can care for you if your caregiver gets sick. For more information, go to cdc.gov and be well, everyone.